Okay. <clears throat> so today we're doing a class uh, about computer and internet security. Um, I, I hope there's no one in here that doesn't think that this applies to them. If you use a computer, if you use a tablet, if you use a smartphone today, computer security, internet security applies to you very heavily. And most things we do in life now are in the digital realm. Um, and all the information we're putting online, all our activities on the computing devices, uh, you know, do have an effect with you know the kind of safety and security uh, that we keep around our, our personal information. Uh, I'm going to show some numbers, some statistics of what's going on in the current state of computer security. Uh, we're not here to scare you. We're here to inform you. Make, you know, make sure that you're infor uh, aware of what's going on out there. And we're also going to tell you how to protect yourself. The kind of things. Um, that we see people doing, um, things that people are believing out in the field. Um, we're going to bring some of those things up. I've got a neat new myth or fact section that we're going to be um, showing everyone uh, based upon some things we've been seeing over the last year. So uh, today's class should be interesting. Um, and, and I apologize for getting started late. I'm usually not late getting over here, but uh, this has just been one of those weeks. So uh, I am Derek Loders. I'm the president and founder of FireLogic. We're a local. Um, what started out as a computer repair company, and now we're a full-blown IT consulting company. We specialize in doing commercial work for small businesses. Uh, we do some stuff for local education and local uh, government. Um, but we also do residential labor as well. So if you need any help with your computer services in the home or at your home office or small office, feel free to let us know. As Ruth said, we do work for her family. Uh, we do work for a lot of others uh, that come out to our classes. We have another proud customer in the front, <laughs> two proud customers. So thank you for, uh, for coming back and joining us for this class. Um, there will be a lot of juicy information that we're going to share with you. Open your eyes in some ways, maybe scare you a little bit, but uh, hopefully you'll walk away with some, uh, some good knowledge and you know, a little bit more than you came with. My colleague over here, Wesley Howard, uh, he is uh, one of my lead uh, consultants on staff. He's my right-hand man pretty much at FireLogic. We've been teaching classes here together for quite some time. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, there's still some seats left on the, on the side over here. Uh, so Wesley and myself, uh, the reason we love doing this class is because we're helping small businesses. We're helping you know, residents. We're helping you know, everyone that we come in contact with. Um, anywhere over here or on the side should be OK. Um, getting things like small business networks, small business computer systems up to par, up to speed, medical offices. We do a lot of work with medical offices that are in the 20th century, to be honest, in the dark ages of, of computer uh, and, and, uh, and network security. And, and it's troubling, you know, because this is the doctor's offices that you go to. And if you knew what we knew, you'd be a little scary, too. Uh, you'd be a little scared uh, as well. So uh, we're doing our best to make sure that these medical offices are getting up to speed. But it's not just medical. It's everyone. Everyone has to do their part uh, in this battle against the bad guys. <clears throat> um, we've got some classes coming up, some neat other topics. Um, you came to one of our, you know, one of our most popular classes here uh, today. But we've got some other ones that uh, we sort of you know, like to ask around and see what people want to hear about. Uh, and we're offering some, some different things in the, in the next few months uh, based upon some of those things that we've heard. Uh, so we've got a brand new offering called Maintaining Your Home PC or Maintaining Your Home Computer for Beginners. Uh, a lot of people ask us when they come to our help desk events, do you ever teach a class about what I can do to keep my computer running smoothly? This is that class, OK? We're going to be offering it. All the things that we do for customers or we teach people when we go out and do service for them, we're going to show you a lot of those things in this class so that you can you know, do some of this maintenance on your own. All these things that you, know, you can't learn at the store, there's no books on, it's stuff that we've learned from industry experience. We're going to give that juicy information away. Likewise, we're going to be redoing our open tech help desk. We did it once last year here at, at Niles. It was pretty successful. I think we were busy, uh, uh, pretty darn busy across those two hours. So we're going to be re-offering that in the next few months. Uh, check the library calendar on that. Um, we're doing a deep dive on, on Microsoft SkyDrive, uh, soon to be called OneDrive. And we're going to be specifically looking at the Office web apps, how you can use those. Most people don't know that Microsoft offers Office completely free in the web browser. So if you didn't know that, you want to learn how to use that, you can come to our SkyDrive class. We're going to show you not only how to use Office web apps, how to store your files in the cloud, 
SkyDrive is built into Windows 8.1. You don't have to do a thing. All you have to do is have a Microsoft account, sign in, and you can start leveraging free cloud storage with that. So that's SkyDrive. Come to that class if you want to learn about how to use free uh, Office on, in the web browser. And then we're going to be redoing our Windows 8.1 class. In case you've missed it, we've done it about four times in the last year and a half or so. But we're redoing it. Lincolnwood Library asked us to do it. So we're going to be back there in March uh, rerunning that class. So a lot of neat offerings that are coming up. I really hope that you guys take advantage of it. Um, you know, come out and learn something new. And, and one thing that I'm really excited about, and, and Ruth has been trying to help us push for, we're, gonna, we're trying to get approval to do the first ever uh, simulcasting where we can have people in on a web conference at our class, as well as having people in person here in class. So we're seeing how that's gonna go. Uh, we're hoping to start that in our class, on one of our classes in the next month or two. Um, in the hope that even if you can't get a seat in one of our classes, you can join us from home and you know, use e-learning. A lot of universities and schools are using this. I wanna bring this down to the library level. So we'll see what happens uh, and, with- And we're working on it. We're working on it, okay. So, uh, and so I'm thinking that maybe one of the big stumbling blocks so that people will know, well, I don't know how I can do that. So we'll try to make, get something going with some kind of little handout sheet mm -hmm. that you would, we would send to you by email or something. I'm, I'm thinking down the line that it, should we be able to get this set up? Mm -hmm. Don't worry about it. If, if you want to try it from home, feel free to do so. <clears throat> um, what's nice about it, uh, we're hoping to leverage the same technology we use with, with doing web conferences with our customers. This means that if you have a Mac, a tablet, just a smartphone, or a Windows PC, you can join us for this class. So it's m really multi-platform, and it doesn't mean that you have to have one kind of computer or another. So. We'll, we'll give you more information on that as the time, time comes. All right. Um, I like to start our security class with a different cartoon every single time. So uh, we've got our gentleman over there. Our, our, our criminals are stealing information. And uh, the one on the computer is saying, the identity I stole was fake. Boy, you just can't trust people these days. <laughs> so there's our, there's our joke for the day. <laughs> So what are we trying to do here today? Our computer secure and internet security class. Everyone should have an agenda. If you don't have an agenda, raise your hand and we will get you one, okay? Um, we have all, most of the topics that we're gonna cover today. There's a few things I added in the last minute which may not be on here, but it gives you a pretty good overview of the things that we're going to uh, cover here today. There's a lot of white space on here, so feel free to jot down some notes or things uh, as we're going along um, and, and hopefully uh, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm hoping to dedicate at the end at least a good 10, 15 minutes for questions. We'll see how it goes. I got a lot of content uh, that we want to cover, but feel free to bring up any questions as we're going along. If you think of something, as long as it's not you know a 10 minute question, I'll tackle it you know as we're going through. So don't feel afraid to uh, raise your hand. Got a little bit of an intro video we're going to show. It's on a topic uh, of rogue wireless access points. You may have heard of this. You may not know what it means. It may sound completely foreign to you. But we got a little clip from that CNN did that we're going to show off. Uh, we have a little bit of an interesting live demonstration, which Wesley is concocting in the corner over there. Um, we're going to go over. We're going to sound like a mad scientist. <laughs> um, we're going to go over some myths, and we're going to see what uh, if we can separate myth from truth out there. A lot of things that people tell me when I go out to uh, service businesses and, and homes and things of that nature. Uh, we have a few slides on myth versus fact. Um, we've got a few topics of, in topics of interest that we're going to cover a little bit more in depth uh, later on, like email security, uh, malware prevention, uh, the things that are really hot and, uh, you know, concern a lot of people, uh, along with giving away a few tips as we go along, as usual, and then again, uh, open Q&A at the end. So that's what we're hoping to cover, and whatever else that you guys bring up, if there's something that we don't cover, um, I didn't put a specific slide on it, I don't know why I forgot this, but um, smartphone security, I'm going to mention it right now for everyone. Since I didn't put a slide, I don't want to forget about it. Uh, if you are using an Android phone these days, your risk of getting infected on an Android phone are pretty heavy. So you want to start thinking about some kind of form of protection on that smartphone. 
Um, in general, smartphones are becoming a big, big target. I think there's a part of my uh, security by the numbers slides uh, that goes over a part of this. But smartphones, since everyone has one and they're always connected to the internet, my gosh, what better target than the little computer sitting in your pocket? So, um, <coughs> even though we didn't put a, a dedicated slide to it, I, I did want to bring that up. Maybe we can have a little further discussion on it a little bit later on. Uh, but the Android phones most definitely are the biggest targets today for getting uh, malware on them, uh, especially if you're downloading things from the Android store, the Google Play store. While most of that is filtered and Google does their best to keep it safe, things have gotten through the cracks. And things are going to start getting through the cracks on the Windows phone store as well as on the iOS store. So it's only a matter of time. So uh, especially for the Android users, please look into uh, a mobile security solution for your phone. We recommend ESET. They have a mobile security product that I used to use when I had an Android. Uh, I do recommend you take a look at it um, because if I show you the number of the number of attacks that are skyrocketing on Android phones, uh, it's going to scare you a little bit. So that's my two-minute spiel on mobile phones uh, and security. Does having an antivirus uh, app on my cell phone help a little? It does. That's that's what I'm recommending. Yeah. Yeah. Having an antivirus on the phone. Yeah, it will definitely definitely help uh, prevent those kind yeah, of things. Um, and you were gonna show the video first. What was that? You were gonna do the video first. You said. Um. Yeah, first video clip. Video clips up. Video clips up next. I just want to get a survey of the uh, of the crowd, um, ju just to make sure that we're covering everything that that people came here wanted to to learn about. Um, what kind of things about computer security scare you the most? Any volunteers? Like Anyone that wishes to share? Vi virus. Yes. Well, just how incredibly easy it is to get viruses because um, I brought my computer in to be debugged by you, mm -hmm. and I was just astounded. We found a lot of nasties on your computer, and, and you didn't even know that it was infected. That's no, the worst part. No, and I don't do anything weird on my computer. I'm not downloading stuff that's suspicious. And, and, and the thing is, you don't, don't have to go out of your way. There's another myth that I yes. should have covered. <laughs> you don't have to go out of your way to get infected these days. I mean, Wes, you tell me if there's something I missed, but uh, infected advertisements on Google, bad search results, rogue websites that are out there that are specifically meant for infecting you. Uh, there was a government, uh, I think the Veterans Affairs website just a few days ago got infected with malware. It was spreading that to people's computers. So even the websites that you think we can trust the most are getting hit with these kind of things. It's happening all over, and it's more prevalent than you may think. Uh, Kelly's phone got hit with uh, an Android virus. Uh, my fiance I even put an antivirus on her phone and didn't catch it. So um, it's it's getting the mobile's definitely starting to become the target because it's more vulnerable. There's less patches, less security. Yeah. So you don't have to go out of your way to, to become a target these days. And I'm going to show you how you can stay safe. Uh, during the course of our discussion here today. Chris, go ahead. What was that thing you wanted well, to bring up? Privacy, probably through viruses and stuff that she captured. So information getting stolen yeah. and credit yeah. card numbers getting stolen, things like that. Identity theft. Identity theft, yeah. yeah, that, yeah. See, sometime during the program today, I want to ask you about a Google came out with a product. It's called the Street Plugin. It's officially called their Customer Relations Manager. When okay. you open up an email, it will tell the other person not only what time you open the email, I can live with that, but it will show them the exact location of where you are when you're reading it. I mean, this problem, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an email this, this bug is, by design. Yeah, this this is has been a problem for many years. This is what the spammers are using to make sure that you're a legitimate person opening up their message. So if you open email from spammers and the pictures load inside that email, what you're getting at, Chris, is the person on the other end can tell when you opened it, the fact that you opened it, and other information of that nature. Where is that what you're getting? Oh, yeah. It tells them where you are yeah. opening it. Yeah. So that's one more reason why you don't want to open spam email. It's spammy. Also, in most email programs, good email programs, have the, the image block feature within them, right? You, don't, you can have the images blocked until you say that it's safe to load the images. Make sure you're using that, or use an email provider that uses technology like that. Gmail does, Outlook.com does, most of the big email providers do these days, but if yours doesn't, you wanna make sure that you're changing uh, email providers, because that is a big, big problem. As soon as you load images from a spam email, that spammer knows, hey, this is a good person, that email works, let's put them on more spam lists, okay? Mm -hmm. 
yes. like online purchasing and like what happened with Target? Well, with Target, that was actually their in-store and uh, there's a lot of uh, different provisions coming out through the government now. Um, what you're going to start seeing in the next year is what's called the uh, scan and chip cards. The way that these are going to work is most cards already have an RFID tag inside of them. And it's just a little chip that broadcasts a radio frequency. And the way that these new cards are going to work is when you go to slide your card, it's also going to check it for that radio chip. And then you're probably going to also have to put in a pin code. So these new cards that are coming out are going to have three separate levels of security as opposed to just the one that the target cards fell vulnerable to. So. And that's along the lines of what I think Europe and the rest of the world is already using. Yeah. Okay. As far as I've heard, we are behind. U.S. is far behind in terms of credit card security. Um, someone was telling me that they went to Canada. Oh, there's you. <laughs> went to Canada and they couldn't use you couldn't use your. Uh, couldn't use the credit card at the gas station. Yeah. Because yeah. we didn't have the. Because our security's tool. Right. Yes. Right. So. Isn't that a shame? Yeah, it is a darn <laughs> shame. <laughs> but but everyone's getting serious now. There's a, a the industry watchdog group uh, that controls how the credit card companies handle data. Um, they have been implementing what's called PCI compliance. They've been getting very strict about it. So they are sort of wringing the hands of all the credit card vendors to make sure that we're implementing these technologies. Uh, you, you know, but it, you can only move so fast. I mean, every store needs new credit card terminals. It's a slow process. It doesn't happen overnight. Maybe how do you know if you're being spammed or what? What was that? How do you know on the computers if you're being spammed? You can check your email inbox. You've got hundreds of messages coming in yeah. from people you don't know. You'll uh -huh. know that oh, you're on spam lists. Oh. So you have to not only make sure you're using an email provider that has good spam filtering technology, but make sure you're not opening that spam. And we'll get into email phishing and spamming. We'll get into that a little bit later on in the discussion today. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely touch on that. Anyone else? Yes. Um, I don't know if this is the right term, but like hijacking, like if you're using internet, mm -hmm. like in a library or Starbucks. Oh, we'll get boy. to that. We'll get yeah, to that. That is our next yeah. topic, yeah. actually. Uh, like Very timely. They say if you have a credit card or like that Ventura card mm -hmm. in your pocket, and if you're too close, it scans yep. it. Yep, so RFID. What do they call that, Wes? Hey, Wes? RFID hijacking? Um, what do you call when you walk by someone and you... All right, so the RFID hijacking, every one of your cards, if you have that little sort of like crooked Wi-Fi symbol on the back of it. Uh, how many people here have a credit card right now? Go ahead and take it out for a second. On the back of your cards, what you'll see is a little symbol. It looks like a little radio antenna. It's uh, slanted sideways. This is a brand new card. Not here. Yeah, yours is okay. Some cards, some new cards don't offer it. No. Like I just got a new card. I mine didn't have yours it on there. I don't see any radio. No, yours is chip. Okay, you're good. Yours has it. Um, most of the Chase cards have it. Oh. That's perfect. Yeah, you're all right. Yours has it. Yep, yours has yours it. The front. On the huh? back, yours has it. Front of it. Yours doesn't have it. Yours doesn't. Yours doesn't. Yours doesn't. You're no, only this one does. Only yeah, this one does. This is mm -hmm. All right. So, so, so what are we looking for? This one looks like a little symbol like this. It's like a little yeah. symbol. It's hard to. Let me see. Um, it doesn't have it. It's mostly Chase that's doing it. The uh, Chase visas. Oh, well, what about Capital One? Um, sometimes they don't advertise it. I mean, it's like it's a little ridge. It's a little square ridge in the car. It looks just like this. If you looking what to look for, it's an icon like that. Oh, no, we don't have that. Okay? It might be on the back of your card. It might be on the front of your card. Sometimes. But a few people do have it here. So, basically, the way that this works is your card's constantly broadcasting all your personal information all the time. If you have this little symbol on the card. The thing is... You have to be about this far away from the car to get that information. And what people will do is they'll walk around with a scanner for the cards in their pocket and they'll brush up against people in an airport or a restaurant and they'll collect that card information. So if you've ever been in line at Panera, you know how crazy that can get. Um, and some people can give me a credit card information. Uh, there are a few solutions, some of them more drastic than others. Um, the most obvious one is to call up your bank and request a card that doesn't have it. Um, alternatively, you can go ahead and get a um, 
a, a drill with a small bit and find the little rays in your card where that chip is and drill the chip out. <laughs> or alternatively, you can purchase what has been adamantly named the aluminum wallet. Oh. It's basically the same Chris, idea. This one's for you. It's, it's the it's aluminum it's wallet. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. basically, what you do is you put your card in this aluminum wallet and it can't be read through it because it's a thick metal shell. So. Really? I personally think the easiest route of getting around this, if you don't like that technology, you can call your credit card company and just ask them to send you a card without it. Which You're not forced to use way. it. It's an opt-out. If you don't want it, ask them to send you a, 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 a broadcasting list card or a chip list card, and they will send it to you. What's it for in the first place? But that's what you use for touch well, and go, right? You ever see? Yeah, touch and go yeah. is what it's for. Yeah. If you've ever been to a McDonald's and they have that little scanner up on their register, you just swipe your card and leave. Yeah. That's very much all it's for. Um, a lot of phones in the next couple of years are going to be start, you know, start coming out with this technology so that you can pay with your phone. Uh, it's pretty much the exact same technology that's on the cards. But that's what they're using for the venture card, right? All the venture yes. cards you're using. All the venture cards. Hmm. Well, it doesn't look bad. But, you know. yeah. um, but the venture card's connected away. to a prepaid account. It doesn't necessarily have direct connection to your, you know, bank account or so. Venture using it's okay. Your credit card using it, mm -hmm. a lot more dangerous. Yeah. Or your debit card, that's even worse. So this is more dangerous with this sign, right? It is more dangerous, mm -hmm. yeah. So if you're uncomfortable with what Les just talked about, I would call the credit card company and tell them I want a card to be sent without that technology in it. I've got and two they will cards. do so. I've got two cards that have it. I don't have an aluminum wallet and I haven't drilled out the card, so <laughs> I, I really... It, you're the expert? I would say take my advice and do what you feel safe with. All right. So somebody asked about uh, Wi-Fi hijacking. It's a per very pertinent topic because we're going to jump into this really quickly. So I'm going to show a quick little video um, that CNN actually did. I think this was just done about two years ago. So it's still very relevant, but it's an even bigger problem today. So. Um, all the information still applies, so let's have a look at what, uh, you know, what they reported on regarding white rogue uh, access points. A bit too loud. Okay. I've got, I've got the CNN app. Oh, really? <laughs> Great. All right. It's a short little video. It's uh, just about three minutes long, so it's not that not that long. It's the most efficient way to use those hours lost in airports. Sending emails, researching, buying, selling, closing deals. The air here is thick with sensitive information transmitted across wireless internet connections. And much of that sensitive information can be read by anyone who knows how. This man looks innocent enough, a business traveler on his laptop. But Kieran Deshpande is an expert in wireless security, and he's watching everything I do online. So I'm connected to one of the open Wi-Fi networks here at Heathrow Airport, and I'm just having a browse around my favorite site. As I casually surf, Kieran sees all. You actually went to the business traveler uh, page. That's what you've been doing. It's all there on his screen. This was pretty harmless spying, but it could have been much more serious. But if I was sending an email or doing some banking, would you be able to see that as well? Uh, if you send some passwords and some other uh, stuff, anything that you're doing on HTTP is pretty much visible to me here. Using open public Wi-Fi is one security risk at airports. There's another, and it's more sinister. Sean Rambert is a white hat hacker He's a good guy in the hacking world. First, he shows me how easy it is to scan the terminal's available networks. And then instantly, I've got, I'm seeing probably 20 wireless networks with four or five of those um, having relatively weak security. Among this list of Wi-Fi networks, there's a fake, a trap. <coughs> I have a colleague that set up a, a, what we call a rogue access point to, to lure someone in, and uh, he's basically called it public Wi-Fi that we can see here. Now, that's my colleague's rogue access point. He's got a, a little access point that's no bigger than a matchbox uh, that he's just got sitting on his lap. And that's now 
basically a public wireless service I mean, that's somebody could use. That's how easy it is. How hard is it to tell the difference between a genuine wireless hotspot and a rogue hotspot? If somebody really wants to uh, capture your traffic, they will pretend to be the public hotspot service provider. So they will pretend to be your BT Open Zone, your T-Mobile, your cloud network. From an everyday traveller's point of view, you're going to find it very difficult to differentiate between good and bad. So are Wi-Fi zones best avoided? The expert advice is to surf securely using VPNs. However, when in a rush, we tend to sacrifice security for speed. Remember to stay alert. A cyber thief may be waiting to mug you in the most clean and bloodless way. Bill Black, CNN, London. Okay, all right. So Interesting video. <laughs> yeah. um, rogue Wi-Fi access point. So when they say rogue access point, what they mean is you go to Starbucks and you're looking for Starbucks Wi-Fi, right? You're expecting to find what Starbucks is supposed to put up for you in a secure manner. And a rogue version of that means that you are connecting to a copycat that is making you believe that you're connecting to the official wireless network for that location. So that was the basis of this video over here. An airport is a perfect example. There are usually four, five, six open networks available at an airport. And the criminals love airports because they are very easy to go in and trick travelers into connecting to these kind of hotspots. Again, like they said, you're sacrificing security. You're in a rush. You got to check email. You got to get back to someone that left you a voicemail. And we do things that get us in traps of that nature. So I'm going to let Wes take him from here. This is his little baby of a slide. So. All right, so here's what we've got. Um, right now, this little box, I picked this up from Goodwill earlier this week. It cost a dollar. It's just an old wireless access point, but we've gone ahead and modified it so that we can make some changes to it, kind of set it up the way we want. Uh, how, many here, how many people here uh, at the beginning of this class connected to that Niles Library hotspot? All right. Derek, if you can uh, go ahead and pull up uh, okay. on me real quick. Sure. Let's plug in. Okay. All right, so what you see here, um, just like that video, um, what we have on this list over here, and I'll show it real quickly. And you notice how all these vendors say Netgear all the way down the list mm -hmm. for the Niles um, Wi-Fi hotspot? Well, uh, what you're seeing is those are all the access points that the library has gone and put in. So every single uh, box that they put in was put in by a company called Netgear. Now on the top of the list we have one made by Linksys that happens to be this box right here. This is not a library wireless access point, but everyone in the room that's connected to the Niles library is on it. And on top of that, what we also have here <coughs> is another window, which I'm going to bring up showing several devices that have attached to our access point. So one thing I just want to stress is that this is not collecting any information other than the device and you know the name of the device. So we're not collecting any personal information or anything. Um, we're just showing the device ID along with the IP address that it's assigned. So on the top of the list we have a couple of iPhones, uh, about three iPhones on the top, my phone on the bottom. Um, I actually name my phone so I can tell what it is on the network. Um, what you have down there, there's a Samsung phone, somebody in here has an HTC, um, some what sort of make? HTC. HTC, it's an Android phone, I'm oh. guessing it's probably a good brand name. So what we have here is, we're just seeing the devices that attach to this little blue box sitting in the middle of the room, but if somebody really wanted to take your information, they could put this box in a backpack with a battery, walk around an airport, walk around a library or school and just passively walk around, not even sitting down, and collect information just by walking through the building. I mean, things like this, um, I mean, people go into a Starbucks, put their backpack down on the ground, use their laptop for two, three hours, walk out with all the information that they collected with the device. Yes. Now, you're probably asking yourself, what can you do about this? I mean, obviously, one way to tell is the vendor list for, the, for this goes and shows it as being sort of off. It's not quite right. So this one box, where we have eight others, this one box is a little bit different. 
Now, the software I'm using is about $40, so it's a little bit much for the average user. But what you can do is, um, there's something called a VPN, uh, it's a, called a virtual private network. What you do is you'd set this up at your house, so every time you're in a Starbucks or a cafe or an airport, you connect to your home internet access, and anything you do between your home and your current computer is completely encrypted. And even if you are using a rogue access point, they can't see any of your personal information, and you're completely safe. So you really have nothing to worry about there. Um, alternatively, I mean, you, you can plug into a hard line if you're at a hotel. A lot of hotels have those wall outlets that you can plug into. You can bring your own wireless portable access point with yeah, you. Yeah, using your phone. phone. I mean, most lo cell companies allow you to use your phone as a tethering hotspot. Mm -hmm. That's very safe. There's no way to hijack the cell signal coming from your phone. Uh, back up to the cell provider, so that's a very safe way to do it. I know a lot of people don't have unlimited data data usage uh, for that, but that is another secure and fairly easy alternative to public Wi-Fi. So is the smartphone being used as a mobile hotspot? As a mobile hotspot, yeah. And you asked me about that in the past, so that would that would be a safe way to do it. And then additionally, Additionally, as you can see in the corner here, see where this is HTTPS? Mm -hmm. A lot of times when you have that S at the end of your URL, you know that that's a secure um, link that is completely encrypted, and that even the person who's setting up a rogue access point like this wouldn't be able to really see your information without some extensive work. That, that S does make it real safe? It, it makes it safer. How do you get, how do you get the HTTPS stay on the site. I've tried this and it will disappear. Yeah, that's Some websites good. only use S for the connection or the login process. Right. It's very expensive to run your website full time with the S turned on. That's why a lot of companies can't do it. Gmail does it for everything. I think Facebook does it for everything, but these guys have a lot of money. Smaller websites, smaller company websites, they can't afford to have their web systems with the extra overhead it takes to run the S technology. And that's why you have some sites uh, even as big as Yahoo Mail. Yahoo Mail didn't have S secure technology, HTTPS, until I think they started like two months ago. Yeah. So I mean, they were way behind the time. So that's Yahoo email. I mean, oh, some of these, um, the some of the SSL connection. layer encryption, which is what it's called. Um, so it's, it's oh. right. I mean, these certificates for these sites can run anywhere between 100 and and $1,000, depending on what sort of certificates they buy. So a lot of smaller websites avoid using it because they do have to pay for that up front. And a lot of these guys, I mean, they make money off the ads on the side of the site, so they're not really interested in that level of security. But your bank, your uh, email, they should definitely have that S when you log in. Um, don't do banking at any public Wi-Fi hotspot. I highly, yeah. highly discourage yeah. it. Um, and does anyone have any particular questions about rogue access points? Um, what about the sending the check? picture from your cell phone to make the deposit? All right, so when you're sending a um, anything over your phone, uh, the cell phone signal is fully encrypted between your phone and your service provider. So that's generally pretty safe as long as your bank doesn't have anything going on on their end. Um, I, mean, I, I can't promise that you're going to be secure at any point because you, know, you have things like Target and these other vendors yeah. having issues. But assuming that the network on the other end is secure, you should be fine. Yeah. The only other thing that could leak through the cracks is if you got an Android and you get malware on your phone and the, that malware attacks leaky apps. Mm -hmm. uh, leaky apps is a big problem. Leaky apps are applications that aren't coded well for smartphones. Um, since these applications are still relatively new in the smartphone uh, realm uh, and there's a lot of them that don't have good security protocols and procedures in place. So, you know, there are applications that can leak data. Snapchat, the teenagers love the Snapchat program. Extremely leaky, all kinds of, you know, backdoors and things that these hackers are finding from that program. So there are a lot of big apps out there that have problems with leaking data out uh, if malware gets on your phone. Um, I think mean the one thing I will say, um, Derek will probably disagree with me on this. Um, if you own an Android phone, you definitely need to have an antivirus on it. Um, it's probably significantly more holes in the Android operating system that we found. And it's more so because of the way that they set it up. The older phones, more so because you can run any app it doesn't necessarily have to be from the app store. And more so because some of these companies, they're putting out their own app store as opposed to using the Google one, which sort of lets in more unauthorized apps. 
Um, if you're using an iPhone, most of the apps have to go through an extensive approval process by Apple. They're all centrally managed, so you have a little less to worry about. But you should still be vigilant. I mean, look at reviews, look at what other people are saying about the app. Just because it looks interesting, it doesn't mean that you should install it. How do we set up a VPN? Do we call you all, or? Um, we can set up a VPN, certainly. Uh, we have, um, you They can even use a, a provider like HMA, yeah. right? I mean, there's plenty of services that sell VPN access. Um, just so that you're secure, they usually have a nominal fee between five and ten dollars a month. But if you're out and about a lot, um, you can hook it up to your phone, you can hook it up to your laptop, and not have to worry about that. <clears throat> yeah, if you're doing a lot of web browsing on the go, especially on a laptop computer, um, you probably might want to invest in a VPN service. Um, one I found with customers that has worked pretty well. Uh, it's called HMA, it stands for Hide My Rear. You can convert rear into a bad word and that's what that stands for. Um, they have a good service that's very, very cheap uh, every month. I don't know, Wes, unless you know any other um, VPNs that are good. I'm using Earth VPN. it's about $5 a month. It's probably yeah. one of the most, yeah. It's, it's pretty affordable. Uh, they just tend to nag you every month for the PayPal payment, but they're pretty what, good. What's the name of it? Earth VPN. Earth? Yeah. So if I connect, if I set up a VPN for my home, mm -hmm. um, then uh, whenever, let's say I'm traveling and I'm in Seattle, I and I go on, uh, go on the internet on my smartphone, can I use that? The I will use that VPN connection that's actually coming from my home. Yeah, I mean the way that it works is, I mean in the simplest form. You have a connection from your computer to your house or to your VPN service provider, either or. And the traffic between those two points is encrypted. It's secured in such a way that the telecommunication company, Comcast, or anyone else that's snooping on your connection can't see what's happening inside of that tunnel. So what it'll do is it'll send it from wherever you are, if you're in Switzerland, and it'll send it back to your house, totally encrypted, and then it'll go out to the internet as if you're at home browsing from your own house. All right, security by the numbers. I like giving everyone an overview of where we stand in terms of all the bad stuff going out out, out there uh, in the world in terms of computer security. Again, not to scare you, to give you the knowledge to be aware of what's going on and what the real problems are uh, out there today. Um, so I pulled a few numbers from Symantec's um, Internet Threat Report 2013. They do a yearly report. Uh, they are a large company that provides commercial and residential uh, security software, all kinds of different things for the enterprise. Um, they know their stuff. I don't like their antivirus program for homes, um, but they, they know what they're doing for the most part on the corporate side. Um, so just some, some statistics that they have given us uh, from their last report. They don't have a 2014 report. They have a 20. 13 that was retrospective upon you know the year before um, so we've got 378 million um, cybercrime victims per year at this point 2.8 times as many babies born each year in the world so um, a lot of crime uh, going on out there in terms of cybercrime we've got a million victims per day happening million victims plus um, and we have 12 victims per second in terms of cybercrime so um, just shows you the scale of you know how bad this problem uh, is becoming. If you feel like you're a victim, can you just change your password? Is that enough? Uh, or if you become a victim of identity theft, it's a lot more than that. You have to go to the credit reporting agencies and tell them. You have to tell the credit cards that you have. You have there's a process you have to go through to expunge that bad record or the bad history that happens as part of that uh, identity theft. So there's like, a few more things than just the password change. Like for example, with Target, you get you notify your credit card mm -hmm. company, you get a new card. Now, if you have an online account with Target, do you change the password? <coughs> you have to change all your passwords. All critical passwords need to be changed, and I, you know, might even want to go as far as changing the account entirely, changing a new, getting a new username at that point. Because if you've been an identity theft victim, it very well could be that they already have the username that you use for that service, and it could just be a matter of time till they guess their way back in yeah. so okay yes when you're using a vpn is it possible still to have a hacker from a website that you go to through your vpn 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. An infected website, that does not combat infected websites. What we're combating with a VPN is rogue access points. Okay. So when we're talking about rogue websites or infected websites, that's where local antivirus software comes into play for your, uh, on, your, on your machine. Um, so. One other thing that I just recently discovered by turning this box off, um, a lot of access points, um, public Wi-Fi, what they'll enable is something called uh, AP isolation. That's where your individual device can only see the internet connection for that hotspot. Um, at the moment, the library doesn't have that enabled, and if you're connected to the network, you can see every other device in the library. And I'll probably talk to you after the class about that. <laughs> <laughs> so in 2012, the semantic says we had a 42% increase in targeted attacks. What is a targeted attack? Targeted attack is a hacker or criminal group that knows exactly who they want to get, and they go after them. So 42%, almost 50% increase in the number of targeted attacks. Uh, a lot of them are from the big boys that you've heard about, Anonymous, and all those big hacking groups that get a big name for themselves. But there's a lot of people that don't go on that have a big public image that are doing just as much damage. So it's not just about the Anonymous and the you know, big hacking organizations. Uh, in 2012, uh, new vulnerabilities, we had about uh, a little over 5,000 vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities are, I, I think they count all the big operating system bugs that are found that cause things like malware and other things uh, to get let through the operating system. So that's vulnerabilities across everything, Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. Uh, average number of identities exposed per breach in 2012, 600,000 plus. So that primarily is skewed by the fact that a lot of these breaches happen from big organizations. Target, I mean, how many did we lose from the target breach that happened? Um, so that is a lot of identities uh, that get exposed. Now, this is not necessarily victims of identity theft. This is the number of records, identity records. So like if you were a record at Target or Neiman Marcus and the hackers got in and took that information, that's considered one identity. So it doesn't necessarily mean that your identity was stolen. It just means that you were potentially at risk for that happening due to an infiltration of that sort. And take a look at mobile vulnerabilities. Here we go. Smartphones. What we thought were safe. In the year 2012, 415 mobile vulnerabilities that were found. These are only the ones that were found. There are a lot of things out there that they don't know about or haven't been exposed yet to the public. So those are just ones that have been publicly reported uh, by the anti-cybercrime uh, organizations. Okay, so it's growing. It's been growing every year since uh, the smartphones exploded in 2008, 2009, and this number will continue to rise. So if you don't think that your tablet and smartphone need to be protected, uh, I ask you to, to take a look at that number right there, okay? Uh, just a few more statistics we have over here. Uh, the amount of spam that hits our systems in billions, so this is in billions, uh, in the year 2012, it actually went down. Spam's been going down. So all the big spam fighting we've been doing, uh, I would expect this to be decreasing because the amount of money we've been pumping into anti-spam uh, fighting has been, has been very heavy for Microsoft and all Google and all the big players out there. So spam is on its way down, but uh, as you can see, 69% of all email is still spam. So we, we haven't won that war yet, but we're getting there. Um, number of all email malware as URL. Um, so 23% of um, emails sent out have malicious links in there. And we're going to talk about malicious links, how to spot them in your email, because that is a big way that I'm getting, especially my business customers, are getting infected, is from clicking on links within... Um, within emails that come through. And especially from organizations or people that claim to be from organizations like Microsoft. And I've got an example in my presentation from actually a, a phishing email that a customer sent me two days before this class. So I have that in there and I'm going to show off all the things in there that I was able to spot that shows it as a phishing and a spam email. So we're going to go over that live example that is, from, like I said, from a customer of ours. Uh, email virus rate in 2012 actually dropped. So virus, uh, you know, the viruses that are actually attached in emails are, are getting less common. Again, that's because all the big boys are fighting spam and viruses in email very heavily. But, the, but viruses are different from infected links. Infected links are very easy to get past email systems because most email systems that are out there uh, do not have effective scanning for this yet. 
So that's why it's more of a personal vigilance matter that you have to make sure that you're doing to make sure you're not clicking on these bad links. And we'll go over that uh, towards the end of the class. Uh, and as you can see in 2012, uh, the overall email phishing rate um, actually went down a little bit. So one in every 414 emails sent is a phishing email. So again, we're getting better. It looks like uh, 2011 had a spike uh, in that number, uh, but it's going back down and hopefully that will continue dropping. But again, as you can see, it's still a big problem uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to security. What was that one about dating emails? Uh, percentage of all spam with dating and or sexual material, 55% in the year 2012. So looks like that's the hooker that they're using for people to click on their spam messages. Sexuality and dating related materials, I guess it's a area that uh, will uh, get people to click on those emails more often. Oh, those are emails. Emails, yeah. Are these gonna be the ads that you see on the sides or something, or no? No, actually emails targeted, looking like they're from dating um, services, looking they're, like they're from someone that's trying to contact you through a dating service. I think that's what they're getting at. Bot zombies in the millions. We're getting better. Bot zombies are computers that have been taken over. We went over this in a previous class. I'm not gonna touch on it as much now because it's starting to drop a little bit, but computers like Windows XP machines that people are using, you get infected by one of these bots, and then you are pretty much at the helm of a bot network, a command and control network. So you have this criminal organization sending commands out over the internet to tell your computer to send spam or send out malware to other people, to your friends list. Go ahead, Wes. Um, on that note, um, you did m mention XP machines. How many people in here are still- We got a thing on XP. We're gonna okay. touch on it just Sorry. a moment. <laughs> But um, bot zombies, um, the number of machines that are acting as zombies is decreasing, um, going down, especially compared to 2010, but we did have a rise in 2012 over uh, year over year. So it is still an issue. It's a very lucrative way of criminals uh, getting a hold of your computer, taking control of it, um, and using it to send out spam and do things that it otherwise you know, shouldn't be doing. So this is how they... This is how most spam on the internet gets spread, is through systems that have been taken over by what's called these, these bot control networks. Uh, another thing on mobile, 58% increase in mobile malware year over year from 2011 to 2012, and I presume 2012 to 2013 is, is, is just as bad or worse. So it is definitely increasing, and it's a big problem because a lot of people just don't take mobile security seriously. Um, it's something that's come up so fast and reared its head so quickly, um, you know, that a lot of people are just caught off guard and none of the big phone vendors are doing anything to uh, inform people about it. So that's why we're gonna definitely mention it and make sure you know about it. Uh, but I think in, overall the industry needs to get better in, in educating people about that. How do you avoid the, the bot people taking up? Good malware software, anti-malware software. Oh. So really the only way. Using a modern operating system, not using Windows XP, not using Windows Vista, using a modern operating system and a good quality anti-malware product. Those are the two best defenses you can have against that. <clears throat> Look at the new number of malicious web domains that came out in 2012, 74,000. And that's only known websites. Known websites that all they're doing is either tossing malware on your computer or other nasties onto your machine or other people's machines. So 74,000 that we know about came out in 2012 alone. I'm sure 2013 has somewhere around 80 to 90,000 extra new web domains out there that are doing that. Uh, and in 2012, the number of blocked attacks per day from the web, uh, 247,000. And these are just the ones that Symantec has counted. This doesn't count ESET, this doesn't count Kaspersky, all the other big antivirus vendors out there. So this is just what Symantec has counted on the market. So it's a lot, and it's getting worse. What are zero-day vulnerabilities? What is that? Zero-day vulnerabilities are vulnerabilities uh, that hit systems um, Wes, can you explain that uh, definition on this a little bit better? No? no. Um, as far as I know, zero-day vulnerabilities are vulnerabilities um, that hit an operating system that the vendor has no knowledge of. So it hits and there's no resolution to it as soon as it, uh, it comes on the market. So it blindsides them. A few good examples of zero-day vulnerabilities. Um, how many people have seen that little coffee cup pop up in the corner of your screen and you just ignore it? It sort of says, please update Java now. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, don't ignore it. Install them because a lot of the Java exploits, um, 
tend to uh, exhibit zero day vulnerabilities. It usually takes them a day or two before they go ahead and put out a patch or a release. Uh, same goes for Flash Player um, or Adobe Reader. Make sure to update these programs when they prompt you to. Don't just sort of say postpone and just leave it in the corner. E yes. even, even on the library computers, because I have gotten some things that tell me to update. Well, you have no control over it. <laughs> I have no control. You don't have any control over, over, those, um, over those machines. The nice part is about the library systems and systems that are in general locked down in an environment like a lab setting or a public library setting is that they have precautions and things in place due to the way that they're set up mm -hmm. to prevent a lot of these exploits from getting in the wild on these systems. The kind of protections that you don't have as a home user because you're not connected to a corporate network like this. Mm -hmm. So that's why there's a big, big problem, especially for home computers, where you don't have uh, things like uh, a group policy, other things that companies use to protect these systems on a, on, a, on a deeper basis, on a deeper level. Like most home computers, you're set up as the person that can control that out entire PC. But if you're in a library, they got it locked down to where you can browse the internet, maybe open some pre-installed stuff, but you can't really install anything, and that's where those yeah. viruses and malware can't really install anything either. Oh, okay. All right, Wesley's favorite slide. Uh, we've been marking this for the last year or so. We're gonna mention it one more time. People still tell us, and we still go out to homes and offices that are running these old programs. Uh, I know it's not your fault, but uh, we do wanna inform you uh, come April, two months from now, Windows XP is dead and Office 2003 is dead. So if you're using these programs in your home or in your office, you need to start thinking about a plan of attack of getting off these systems. And unplugging your system from the internet, leaving it in a corner is not a good solution. I'm gonna to touch on that in our myth versus fact section uh, in just a little bit. So uh, we've been working around the clock to get computers updated at businesses and, and homes that are running these old copies of, of software. As you can see, especially in the case of Windows XP, we're talking about a 13 plus year old operating system. In the computer world, that is ancient. That is dinosaur era <laughs> software, okay? I think they say that um, five years in the computer industry is 50 years in the pharmaceutical industry. <coughs> and there's a long time in computer time span, okay? So uh, start thinking about what you're going to do. Most people are moving up to uh, Windows 7 or Windows 8 or for any of, on the Mac side, you know, you get a, um, go to a Mac operating system and some people have moved even to Linux. So there's a lot of different options or Chromebook. We even have Chromebook users out there. Uh, Chromebook is also a new operating system from Google. It's pretty much a web browser that you use full time for your computing needs. Uh, so that's also an option uh, that's been out for now a year and a half, two years or so. All right, fun little new section, myth versus fact. We're gonna see how much uh, the crowd knows over here in terms of uh, computer security, okay? So myth or fact, what do we think? Unplugging my Windows XP computer from the internet will Keep me safe. I think I kind of gave this one away. Oh, yeah. so. <laughs> I don't know how much more I can say about it. Um, but this is actually a, a big myth. The problem with this kind of, and I'm going to explain this graph in just a moment. The problem with the mentality of people that tell me, I'm going to unplug the computer from the internet. I'm not going to let it touch the internet. I'm going to leave it in a corner, and I'll just use a thumb drive to copy dead over to it, work on it as I need. So when you're disconnected from the internet, what does that mean you're also disconnected from? Right. Antivirus updates. Mm -hmm. So you have a hotbed, a little honeypot that is growing and festering on that little XP computer or as many XP computers as you have. So what are you doing? You're using thumb drives, which are big uh, places for infection these days. Chris Lee, you can agree with me on, on that, right? <laughs> um, so thumb, dr thumb drives are a big problem today with, with getting infected. So what do we do? We take our thumb drive, we put data on it, we can get infections on that. We transfer to that XP computer that hasn't been updated then at that point for six months, a year, two years, or worse. I don't want to know how long they're running that system. And then all those things start festering, and then we're copying data back to our live internet machines. And we're just extenuating this problem of, of, of growing malware on that machine and transferring it back. Uh, and that's just one of the problems with, with doing things like that. I mean, then at, you're also exposed to holes within Windows XP or old operating systems that if you get a bug in your thumb drive and you move it to that computer, if that bug is meant to exploit some kind of vulnerability in that old system, 
It's going to do it. It's going to steal the data off that system. And again, you're going to go ahead, transfer that back to your regular computer. And if it's not caught, you're going to be transmitting all that juicy information back to the bad guys. So, so the, the mentality that you're going to segregate that system or quarantine it doesn't hold up in my book. And most security experts will tell you the same exact thing. This uh, slide over here, this is from Microsoft. Probably the most um, the trusted authority that would be able to tell us how many machines in the world are getting infected with malware and bugs and exploits on their system. They have a tool that they release part of Windows Update called the Malware Removal Tool. And this machine collects statistics based upon how many machines get infected and are cleaned off in the world. So this tool is tell this little graph is telling us uh, this is these are statistics that they released I think uh, August 2013. So they're still fairly relevant, still fairly new. Um, and as you can see here, Windows XP, for every thousand systems Microsoft's cleaned with this tool, 11.3 systems have been infected. Look how drastically different that is from Windows 7, 4.5 or 3.3 machines per thousand, or Windows 8, which is extreme, which is under a system per thousand. So you can see which are the safest versions of Windows to be using and which ones are the most dangerous. As you can see, Windows Vista is also fairly dangerous. So Windows 7, 32-bit uh, is, is up there, but Windows XP by far trounces everyone else in the list over here. So um, it, I, hopefully that information provides some insight as to how bad using XP is now, and it's going to only keep getting worse as time goes on. And again, these numbers are straight from Microsoft, who has insight to all their systems across the world. Yes? Can you log on to that Microsoft mail, well, uh, malware removal tool and have them remove if you're running, If you're running Windows updates on a monthly basis, that tool is coming as part of that update process. Well, they pretty much force it on you. In other words, I would have to log on to uh, access. What kind of machine are you using? What, what kind of system do you I think it's a, a 7 Windows 7. Windows 7? Okay, so you have to go into your control panel and you can run Windows Update. And most control Windows systems and then Windows Most Windows, Windows systems are running these automatically every month, but if they're not, you want to check and make sure. So they're doing it automatically, but I don't know that because sometimes I get a message. When you see where it says update. Windows has updated your computer, right, please restart, right. that's that process. That's that, okay. So. But that malware removal tool doesn't clean everything off. All they target is the most, uh, the, the worst viruses, the worst malware on the market. They don't target everything. They're only targeting the ones that are affecting the most machines, giving us the most problems. So you, it doesn't replicate a malware, good anti-malware program. It's just a last line of defense that Microsoft releases to help us out. But it's not a full-blown ongoing protection program. Okay? What, what exactly does that mean that XP will no longer be supported after April. Can, can you get so, it? so what the difference is, it means that when my, what I've been telling people and Microsoft's been saying is after April 10th, I believe, of 2014, uh, two months away, you're on your own. You can keep running XP, you can connect it to the internet, you can do whatever you want with it. It's not going to break. It'll still continue working, oh. but any exploits that come out, any uh, vulnerabilities that are released by hackers, uh, you, you have no protection from that from Microsoft. You are on your own. Uh, let me add one other note to that. Um, this also means that most uh, software vendors are also going to drop support for XP about the same time. So that means if you're using Google Chrome, you won't get any new updates. If you're using Firefox, the updates will start slowing down. I mean, uh, Java, Flash Player, I mean, these other programs that could be a secondary source of infection for your machine um, might become a point of vulnerability in the system. So. Just because you know, Microsoft's dropping support for XP, that's one level of security. <coughs> it's all the other companies whose software you rely on that's going to be the downfall of that system. And I didn't have time to pull the link for this class, but a few days ago I saw it come across my news feeds that there are some cyber, uh, cyber security professionals that have been scanning the underworld of the internet to see what the bad guys have been talking about. And they're already seeing discussion that the bad guys are storing hundreds of new vulnerabilities for Windows XP that they're going to release the minute support drops. Okay. So they are, they are working together and putting together a mother load of infections and bad things that they're going to release as soon as Microsoft says goodbye XP support. So it's, it's getting bad. It's festering and, and that's just the tip of the iceberg for what we're hearing on the, uh, in the underground. So if, if that doesn't make you change your, <laughs> change your ways, I don't know what will. Okay. <clears throat> All right, another myth or fact. What do we think? Keeping a password on my laptop will protect it in case of theft loss. False. Fact. Myth. I guess it's a myth. <laughs> myth? Yeah. 
It's a myth. Having a password is a good thing, uh, but it's not going to stop even amateur hackers, am amateur thieves out there. Um, because, as you can see here, this is someone pulling a disk drive out of a laptop. This is something we do on a weekly basis for customers all the time. It doesn't take much to steal data off of a stolen, uh, off of a machine that's been taken from you. So it's good that you have a password on it. That'll stop the person that doesn't know anything about how to get data off of there. But if they know something about how to get a drive out of there and they have a cheap computer system where they can run something like an ultimate boot CD off of, they can usually get access to your data. So don't think that a password alone is going to protect your laptop. What you should be using, and this is something that we've been installing in medical offices, especially due to HIPAA regulations, but uh, we use it on all of our company computers now as well, is a tool feature called BitLocker from Microsoft. It comes as part of Windows 8 um, Professional, and it goes ahead and not only does it force you to use a password on your laptop, but it, for, it goes ahead and it locks everything on your disk drive, so that even if your laptop gets stolen, the only way that someone will be able to unlock that is if they know your password to your computer. Is BitLocker available for any OS other than Windows 8? It is not available to consumers for anything under Windows 8. Pro. Windows 8 Pro. So it's not on the home version. You have to get the professional version of it. Um, and there are a lot of computers you can get with Windows 8 Pro. It's usually what we like to sell uh, to customers due to that. Um, it's a great, it's a free tool. It locks up your hard drive. So, and I tested it. I, I have it on my machine. I took my disk drive out. I tried to break into it. it everything's like gobbledygook. You can't see anything that's on the drive. BitLocker? It's called BitLocker, yes. How, do, in, how do I upgrade to Windows 8 Professional? <laughs> um, <laughs> Go to the store and buy it? or You can purchase it. it, you can download it straight from Microsoft. Can you download it? So, okay. I, can you chat with her aside on that? Yes, thank you. That. Um, was there another question over here on the question? Yes. Were you suggesting that we should uh, eliminate uh, XP and... Uh, I'm begging you. I'm, I'm not asking you. I'm begging you to take XP off your computer. It's not a question of if I'm asking. Yes, buying a new computer is the best way, easiest way to go ahead and get off XP. We used to do taxes on the XP. Buying the is it still okay to use the tax? It's a problem because some old software. The older the tax software is, the tr more trouble you're going to have on a newer computer. Now. They've alleviated a lot of that, and, and I would say software going back until about the mid-2000s is usually okay to work, but if it's older than 2005 or so, you might have a tough time reinstalling it. So, We like to recommend Lenovo, HP, and Dell. Those are the top three that's, that we is usually that like. Lenovo? Lenovo, by far, is our, our favorite. I have a question. Yes. Right. You said the only way to avoid these problems is to buy a new computer. Okay, but a lot of people on their old computer that have files. Is there a danger in transferring these files from the old computer? As long as you're, when you're transferring, you have good antivirus on the new machine. So usually when we transfer our customers, we make sure that ESET is on there, the NOT32 we talked about. Right. We make sure that's on the system. So everything being transferred to the new machine is being scanned as it's being moved in. So we make sure there's all the nasties are removed and okay. everything's nice and clean then on the system. So it can be done, it's just you have to have that level of vigilance and use that anti-malware program when you're transferring. Yes? Nothing, okay. <clears throat> so password is good. You do want to make sure you're using a password, but if you want to go to the next level, make sure that if you lose your laptop, then nothing will be stolen, especially if you're a business professional. If you're traveling around with people's tax data or social security numbers in your laptop, you better pray that no one steals that laptop if you're not using uh, you know, something like BitLocker or there's TrueCrypt as an open source version of BitLocker. Um, there's, there's a lot of options out there these days. <clears throat> All right, myth or fact, formatting my computer hard drive keeps my personal data safe. What do we think? All right, that is indeed a myth. What most people think about with formatting their hard drive these days, they think about the formatting process that Windows allows you to do before you install Windows or if you're reinstalling Mac or any computer system. Um, unless you're doing what, what we use or, um, or using a program that allows you to do what's called a seven pass government grade wipe. This is the kind of procedure the federal government uses when they get rid of computer systems. That's the only true way you're going to make sure that those remnants of files are off of your disk drive. 
You have to think of it this way, and this is a per perfect um, example, metaphor for what this means. When you format your drive in a most basic manner in Windows or Mac, when you're doing a reinstallation, all you're doing is separating the treasure map that tells where the files are and the files themselves. The files are still there. So anyone with rudimentary data recovery software can go ahead and find those files on that disk drive, unless you're doing that government grade wipe. Seven passes of writing over with gobbledygook information on that drive. Mm -hmm. So if you're tossing, this is very important because a lot of people are throwing old computers away or donating old computers. Uh, a lot of people say, hey, can I just give that computer to Goodwill um, without doing anything to it? No, you have to go through and do a government grade wipe on that computer. We can do it. There's free software out there that you can download that can do it. You can ask us about that. Um, but just formatting it alone in the Windows setup process or Mac setup process, it's not going to do a darn thing. So this is, uh, this is very, uh, very, very important, especially business computers, especially if you have social security numbers or any kind of personally identifiable information from customers on there, or your personal tax returns. I get a lot of residents that ask me, hey, I want to donate my old computer, but I've had all my tax returns, and they say, well, I, I transferred those off my computer. Doesn't mean anything. Those copies of the files are still there behind the scenes, and a person with even a little bit of data recovery knowledge can grab that information right off that machine. If you're putting information in files onto thumb drives, does the computer still make a copy of it and put it on its own hard drive? No. Say that once more? If it, if you you do just what? said if you take all the files off of your computer, mm -hmm. the computer's made a copy of it, you still have to wipe it down. Yes. Now, if you take those files and originally you just put them onto a thumb drive, mm -hmm. does the computer make a copy of them anyway and put them on its own hard drive? Yes. If you, especially Office programs. If you're using Office on that machine and saving Word files or things like that, oh, wow, okay. the temporary saved information is still being stored on your computer. Okay. So bits and pieces of it as you're working get chopped up and saved on the machine. So uh, yes, not entirely they may not be on there, but a, a determined criminal could go ahead and piece things together if they really wanted to. Um, one thing I want to say, a lot of new computers, they come with what's called a solid state drive. And by default, <coughs> these drives use a rudimentary form of encryption. If you were to reformat a solid state drive in these newer computers, you, you then wouldn't have to wipe it. Actually, the reason that they do this encryption on the newer drives, these solid state drives, is because you can't wipe them because the way that they build them, you wouldn't be able to get a clean wipe across the whole thing. So it's got that encryption already built in. You can just delete the partition or the information and it'll be gone. Yeah, but the prevalence of those drives is very minimal at this point. I mean, we're really one of the few people or places that are you know pushing those kind of drives right now. For all intents and purposes, 99% of computers that you are using right now have the traditional style drive that is vulnerable to this kind of an issue, okay? So before you cross anything, before you donate anything, make sure that a professional or yourself wipes it to government grade standards. Somewhere I heard that you can smash the computer. You can smash it, yep. Like, uh, like the top of it, or what? No, I, the, the disk drive. So you see people show um, with, with it drilling or smashing the disk drive um, part of it, that's usually what people talk about. But I would say, I've seen people that don't do it properly and think that they're going to smash the top of it and it's okay. Yeah. You have to remember that the inside of the disk drives have the, the, uh, the equivalent of organs that are still okay unless they're actually damaged. Mm -hmm. So you can bend the exterior of the drive, but the inside could still be okay. A professional determined criminal could transplant that to another disk drive and get all of your juicy information from it. Mm -hmm. So I tell people, don't do the smashing method. I know everyone wants to be Arnold Schwarzenegger, but <laughs> save, save this. Do the wiping process that we talk about. You're going to guarantee 100% that all the data will be gone as opposed to potentially being gone by doing a, a smashing of some sort. Will work on that too, <laughs> what? If you took an electric sander, took a layer off of the hardware. Well, they, they would do it, but okay. how many people are going to open that disk drive up? I mean, they use little star bit screws to get into the inside of it. It's kind of tough to get inside those drives. Oh, okay. I mean, they're meant to be sealed for a lifetime, so. Uh -huh. Which I mean, is more expensive, the uh, get, getting a new computer or just reloading uh, Windows 8? Um, if your machine's do. running Windows XP still, it yeah. probably can't take the new Windows. Oh. It's too old. And even if it could, you probably don't want it to. Okay. Yeah. Well, if you've got seven, can you move up to eight or download eight? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can do it. We do it quite often for people. Yeah, yes. Did you anything special with the thumb drive, the flash drive? 
Um, with the thumb drives, I probably, if you're going to throw them away, even if it's if you think it's broken, I would usually, I would still crack the board on that. I think that's usually the safest. That's usually what we do when we dispose of thumb drives like that. Crack the thing in half, make sure you can see the circuitry broken on that. You don't want to just toss those away because, again, the same kind of thing exists. Those kind of drives can store uh, a data behind the scenes, even though you think that you deleted the stuff off of there. So, same kind of problem exists. Myth or fact, public phone charging stations. We've seen these in airports. They're, they're starting to show up in malls. Are these pretty safe? No. Nope. I guess not. If you've got it here, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make this harder. <laughs> that is a myth. Um, and it's actually something that Wesley brought up uh, to put in this presentation. Uh, I didn't even think about it, but these charging stations, Wes, actually, I'll let you describe the um, I actually just did this for Giacomo for uh, Oak, and they're putting in one. <coughs> um, basically, the way that it works, um, <coughs> has anyone ever heard of jailbreaking a phone? or? Yeah. Okay. No. So basically, a lot of these phones, they have an option where you can restore the operating system on the phone if something gets, goes kahooey. Uh, you can plug it into iTunes and it'll do a restore for you and fix the mm -hmm. phone. Well, a lot, of, um, a lot of hackers, what they'll do is they'll set up a little booth like this. They'll usually be slightly less professional than this, but I, mean, I wouldn't trust this alone. Uh, what they'll do is they'll set it up so that when you plug your phone in, they'll download all your pictures. Who's ever plugged their phone into their computer and then had all your pictures pop up? Do you have you? I mean, it's more so the iPhones and iTunes, <coughs> they'll do that. But what it'll do is there'll be a computer, like a laptop, inside of this charging station, and it'll just start dumping all your photos, all your documents, everything that's on the phone. Or, better yet, it'll go and install a program on your phone without asking you for permission. <laughs> So what Apple and uh, Android have done lately is uh, they've kind of set it up so that it'll do data only or charge only when you plug your phone in. Um, same with Apple, it'll ask, do you trust this device? Please enter your code. So this is becoming less and less of a problem, but if you have an older phone that's running an older version of iOS, um, Usually the really cheap Android phones that yeah. like the third rate carriers, they're susceptible to this kind of problem. Yeah, I mean, they can just plug it in and it'll just start downloading all of your stuff. So just uh, be cautious when you're on the road. And who are the ones that were hit with this at the expo? Oh, the DEF CON um, event, right? Yeah, they put one of these in at an event called DEF CON. Uh, it's a hacker conference that they have every year. It's a whole bunch of white and gray hat hackers, they go there. Um, it's kind of a joke, never use the Wi-Fi, never leave your Bluetooth on, and <laughs> basically do nothing, because they're gonna hit you from every direction. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, they put your name up on a board with like your baby photos. Uh -huh. you know, <laughs> yeah, whatever they pull off your phone, they'll just put it up on a big TV and just have it float across the room. So, um, but they put one of these in over there, and these are the foremost experts in computer hacking, computer security in the US, and they fell victim to the same problem. So yeah. it definitely is a big issue, uh, and even the good guys are getting uh, hit oh, by yeah. it. They had a screen on it that said free charging station with all this nice graphics, and then you, they plug in the phone, and it would instantly pop up, sorry, you've been hacked. Luckily, this is just a demo. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, um, we've pounded this one away before a little bit, but free antivirus, uh, ABG, ABAS, are these programs as good as the paid programs? I'll bet it's no. <laughs> um, this one should be fairly easy. <laughs> uh, um, on that note, um, well, I'll let you guys answer. What do you guys think? No. 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 If it's All free, right. it's not good. <laughs> and in addition to the free ones, we also have uh, uh, programs like McAfee, Norton, uh, that have the paid versions. They're about as good as the free ones you get from Comcast. They're not worth anything. So if you have Norton or McAfee, we usually don't recommend paying for it. I think the two that we actually put any credence behind is uh, ESET NOD32. Um, there's an ESET uh, cybersecurity for Mac also. Um, and then the other one is Kaspersky that we, if somebody has it, we won't recommend that they uninstall it. Yeah, so Virus Bulletin, this is pretty much the consumer reports of the antivirus industry. They've test, been testing pro these programs since, I think, 1998 for a very long time. ESET is still at the top of their list. They have won the most awards from that company. Um, part of the reason why we like to recommend them, they're very you know, uh, secure and trusted. Um, the only free product that shows up on this list, even, 
is ABG. All the other free ones didn't even make it because they had scores that were so low and they didn't win enough awards uh, on this testing process. So uh, this puts into perspective, um, you know, just how poor these free antivirus programs are. So it, it, what I say is better than nothing, but if you look at the statistics compiled in the last 13 uh, plus years, uh, they just do not hold up. They do not. What's the uh, approximate price on the NRB32? Anyway. It goes by yearly subscription, $40 for one year or $60 for two years. So, And if you want to find it, uh, we have a link to it on our website. Uh, so an antivirus uh, app from uh, the Play Store really aren't that strong? Oh, no, no. The actually, ESET makes, so they have to submit the programs to the Play Store, whatever store they're in, so they have a version that's for the phone that you can get in there yeah, as well. Yeah, I downloaded a antivirus program yeah. from the Play Store. Yeah. As long as it's from a trusted vendor, I mean, we recommend ESET, but I think Kaspersky has one, and some of the other um, big one, the big boys have one. But uh, yeah, as long as it's from a trusted name that has a good program, you should be okay with it. But if you need to find a link to ESET, just go to our website, firelogic.net, uh, click the drop down for products, and then recommended products, and you'll see a list of all the software that we recommend. That's uh, firelogic.net. Yes, yeah, Chris. Where, where did Bitdefender um, fit in? The ESET is. Bitdefender? Yeah. Oh, the ESET. Yes. Bit Defender doesn't show up on, on this chart over here. And these numbers, so these numbers are, are a little bit older. I think some of these oh, okay. were up until 2012, so they haven't been updated extremely recently. Um, so what they're showing, again, are just averages okay, on this chart over here. For is Bit Defender as good as ABD? Um, Bit Defender is the, one, the only free one that we're recommending right now. So. I mean, what? Yes. I highly recommend no, you're this saying piece, that so you, you, you will recommend this non-32 after installing it, delete any of these other uh, programs you have, like Norton or Webroot or whatever. Get rid of it. Yeah, you don't want to run any. You don't want to run more than one antivirus program. People think you're going to pile them on, yeah. and it's going to make things better. It makes things considerably worse. Yeah, because There's the example worse. you gave, the person had problems when she deleted these other one antivirus programs. Then her problem went away. Earlier, you know, when I was talking in the beginning, that's what I explained right. that <coughs> my, my daughter had uh, unintentionally when she when she added the the ESET program to her brand new laptop computer, their approved style <laughs> in terms of it was actually an excellent new Windows 8.1 computer. And when she loaded the new stuff, she started having problems. And it wasn't until her sister had said, well, talk to your mother, because she said, add this to your, pro your computer, and then you had a problem. And that's when I immediately said to her, are you running another security program at the same time? Because they will fight. Yep. Oh, so you wow. must only have one. It's like a big boxing match. So think of one pro one program controlling the ring, the boxing ring. If you as soon as you put another one in there, that's when the boxing match gets underway. You put a third one in there, it's a grudge match at that point. So So you say log log on to your site and then from your site. We have a link on there, yeah. Have a link. Yes. Okay. Under under recommended or under products there's a recommended products okay. page that we have. And the problem went away the minute she uninstalled the other. Right away. Answers. It's instantaneous, yeah. So we have a lot of people that come in and they got two, three antivirus programs and they think, wow, I'm protected better than Fort Knox. No, you're making things a lot worse yeah. here, so. One is good, three are three times as good, right? I mean, the only, Not in the antivirus world. <laughs> the only combination that we should probably recommend is the use of ESET NOD32 along with another program called Malwarebytes, uh, which um, combats malware. That's probably the only team of yeah, software. They kind of work together. Those are one of the few symbiotic relationships that can exist together, but there's something like Norton antivirus and McAfee antivirus and ESET antivirus that is a bad combination. You can't have these big antivirus programs running at the same time. But something like a malware specific program and ESET, that is a good tag team combination. We put that on systems that are high risk with teenagers and things like that. Now, and if do, you need you have, do you have instructions or guidelines for how you delete these or, or un, un, uh, install these? Every program has a different process. We can help you walk through that. Um, you know, if you want to give us a call one day, we can help you walk through that installation process. Okay. okay. But every company is, is different for it. And if you need a reason to get off on the cafe, uh, we can check YouTube for uh, what their founder thinks of the software. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's a, and that's a fact. That's so we're, 
So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna keep moving here. We got some some more things we want to cover. Uh, myth or fact? My friends tell me Macs do not get viruses. They get fewer. <laughs> they get fewer viruses. They have fewer viruses out there. Um, but that is indeed a a myth. Um, so Sophos, a company that is another big security vendor out there, they very recently said that one in every 36 Macs actually has a form of malware that infects Mac systems. Uh, that's 2.7%, and I think that number was from late 2012, so that is probably higher at this point. Um, so again, it, it's a matter of who are the most vulnerable victims out there? Who has the biggest ocean of potential victims? Windows by far. That is why we've had such a big problem on the Windows side. But now Macs are becoming more popular. They're almost 10% of the population of computer users. The criminals are saying, hey, these people usually have a lot of money to spend, and we have enough of these systems out there to make it worth our while to target them. So that is why the Mac virus situation or malware situation is starting to become an issue. Okay? So if you're running a Mac system, you should be running anti-malware software on there. Don't believe in the, when, when people say, you know, Macs do not get viruses, that is completely untrue. Uh, today. And this graph over here from, uh, this was from Symantec. Uh, we had 10 new Mac threat families that came out in 2012, by far almost double of what we had uh, the year before in 2011. So it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely growing. Uh, as, as far as the uh, Mac threats go, uh, one thing I will point out is thus far since the stream's been kind of slow, um, that ESET antivirus um, combined with keeping all your software up to date from Apple, probably the best way to combat it. Apple's been really good at patching a lot of these security threats, um, either by disabling things like um, Java or Flash Player when they cause a security threat until they go and release their updates. So Macs tend to be less vulnerable to zero day exploits. There was a thing called a flashback that hit. What was flashback? Late 2012, yeah. was it? Flashback infected 600,000 Macs in a single release of that piece of malware. It was a big infection. It was one of the biggest breaches that Apple had, uh, and that was back in 2012. So you know, it, it's only a matter of time until something like that happens again. Myth or fact? My small business is too small to be a target. It is. Yeah. Um, Big, big myth, big, big myth that uh, a lot of people uh, believe in today. A lot of small businesses that we work with say, hey, we're not a city bank. We're not a big healthcare provider. We're not a big investment firm. Why would they target us? Well, look at the statistics. Target attacks are hitting. 50% of all target attacks are targeted towards small and mid-sized businesses out there. So you are half of the um, uh, user base that these criminals want to hit. And why would they go after? Even though the payloads are bigger, if they get past the systems at the big boys, why would why why do you think it's a good idea for them to be attacking the small and mid-sized businesses? Oh, less security. Let's think about it. They have less security. Exactly. All these small business owners think that I'm so small, I work from home. Why would I matter? You are a very easy fish to infect, to target, and. When you have to think about all the work that criminals have to go through to get a, through a system at a city bank or one of the big players, it doesn't take much to get past what we see in homes and small offices, these little pieces of junk. Okay? So we have a lot of businesses that run stuff like this, and that's just part of the problem. It's not just your network security. It's the, the, end, the antivirus. It's your policies that you have on your systems, how you're patching them. There's a lot of things that go into how secure your setup is. But... You know, if you think you're too small of a fish to fry, you're 50% of the target out there uh, right now. So if you're a small business owner and that's the mentality you had, uh, you definitely need to, to think again. The, um, the other reason that they go after the small guys like this, should there be some miracle where you actually catch one of these boneheads stealing your stuff, nine times out of nine and a half times out of ten, these small businesses don't have the money to pay the lawyers to exactly. go after these guys. So they just forget it, drop the charge. It's cheaper for them to just move on. And do exactly. They, they, won't pro they won't prosecute. <laughs> exactly. Um, when it comes to a, a small business being attacked as well, another part of the problem is they don't have the systems in place that the big guys can spend on to actually see and notice that they've been attacked. The number's not on the screen here, but there was another statistic that said 
like 65, 70% of small businesses that are in, 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 intruded upon, they'll never know it. They never know it until it does damage to them in the form of identities being stolen, uh, records being exposed, or you know, they, they, them being made a case study on a news program. So uh, that's another big thing. The big players, the big boys, all the, big, the city banks of the world, they have multiple levels of systems that can watch over and see when someone gets in and they know about it. But you don't hear about the small businesses in the news because they don't have the systems that can you know, watch after that. So uh, as you can see, uh, the, the median cost per day for, for downtime due to these kind of intrusions <laughs> Uh, by these cyber criminals, median cost of about twelve thousand five hundred per day. It's very expensive. We have helped organizations that have been hit by things like this. Uh, luckily, we caught it, you know, at the at the butt of the problem. But you know, if it got worse, I can only imagine, you know, what would have happened. <clears throat> All right, I want to do a little survey of the crowd over here. Your remote, your favorite password. Everyone's got a favorite password that you use, right? Okay. So think about that password. Um, I want you to raise your hands, if you have that password in mind, I want you to raise your hand if that password is at least eight characters long. Raise your hand, please. Okay? Keep your hands up, keep your hands up actually. Um, keep your hand raised, lower your hand if you don't have numbers and letters in that password. Very good. Lower your hand if you don't have a special character somewhere in your password. What's a special character? What special character is an at symbol, pound, exclamation mark, anything of that nature. Not a capital letter. Not a capital letter. That's not considered special. <laughs> we drop by more than half. Yeah. Look at that. More than half the crowd dropped their hand as soon as I said special characters. So the at symbol. As, asterisk or somewhere. something like that, right? As asterisk, any of those yeah. symbols that we have on the top uh, number row for ourselves, those are considered special characters when you hold the shift key and hit that character. So only three people I counted that have what we consider a complex password this day and age. What so meets the minimum requirements of something that you should have to keep uh, keep your computer safe. Or whatever account you're protecting safe. Go ahead, yes. Yes, uh, well, uh, these passwords with all of these uh, indicators are passwords I have done within the last, set up within the last year. And when I set it up, there are instructions. Be sure to include this character, be sure to include numbers and so on. And there's even one that I created that had a uh, uh, feedback saying mm -hmm. this is fair, a monitor oh, yeah. is good. So a lot of places are doing that these security. days, but there are some so that, that don't makes do it. A, that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your Windows computer, your Windows XP computer, for example, will never tell you if your password is too complex or uh, or not complex enough. So I don't, I don't think any of your copy Windows until Windows 8 was telling people about that. So that's just Windows, for example. But a lot of websites from small organizations, they don't have the tools or the money to invest in putting in a protection system to tell people how strong their password is. OK? So passwords are very important. We use them in almost every service we use. I wanted to dedicate just a slide about it. Um, we love to hate our passwords. Uh, but just a few tips to keep in mind when you're thinking of new passwords or if you're going to go back and change your password. As you saw, most of us are not using good passwords in the crowd. So I think many of you should reconsider that. Uh, don't leave passwords on stickies by your computer. I can't imagine how many times you keep saying this. <laughs> some people refuse to listen. Not, not just stickies. We have some clients that hand us a sh printed sheet of paper with their <laughs> bank account info for like six banks and then their internet passwords for emails and everything. And it was just like, yeah, just use the whichever one you need. And I'm like, and then the kicker is when you're done with it, they tell you to throw it in the bin on top of their desk. <laughs> So don't use any passwords that are purely based on words. These are the ones that become at risk. And actually, next slide, I'm going to show you other something else that's a little freaky. You might be, uh, you might be a little scared to learn about. But anything that has a string of normal words found in a dictionary, that is very, very high risk. Unless you're combining special characters and uppercase num uh, characters and numbers in between that, you do not want to use strings of regular words. You are very vulnerable to what's called dictionary hacking, which is the oldest form of password cracking out there. It takes criminals no time to get into your account if you have very simple passwords like that. Two minutes. Uh, and two minutes. As I said, uh, don't use any passwords that are less than eight characters, even if you can do so. 
And always be remember to use a combination, as I said, numbers, letters, special characters, and upper oh, sorry, and uppercase uh, letters for yourself. If you have one of those, each of those uh, aspects in your password, you probably have a pretty good password How for yourself. How do you remember all these passwords? Well, well, I remember all these passwords. Well, don't write them down on a sheet of paper. Write them on a sticky. I mean, here's one way. Here's that's impossible. The way that I do it, I usually have one base password that I use, and I'll change a character here. Like, uh, okay, I'm gonna give away a little bit. Here's my trick. Um, you have a base password, and then let's say that's like Chase Bank. You throw a C on the end of it, uh -huh. or let's say it's like um, oh. your Google email. You throw a G on the end of it. Oh, okay. Oh. So using patterns, doing your passwords in in, in patterns. And this is what most of the security experts recommend for this password problem is make patterns up for yourself. Get some kind of base, add some kind of special symbol to it, and then at the end of that, either put a, a, a one character to denote the name of the organization or the website, or just write out an abbreviated version of it. Like if it was a password for city, you'd put CITI at the end of it, and use that base in combination with the ending, and that's usually pretty safe. And you can then have that mental record of, you know, what would the password be? It's got to have that ending on it based upon what side it is. So that's one way to do it. There's all kinds of ways to, to set these patterns up for yourselves. Hmm. So here's something I'd like to show off. We, we showed this in the intermediate class that we did on computer security. I wanna show this in this class. I think this is very important to open your eyes a little bit. Um, there is a theory out there by an individual by the name of Steve Gibson. He's one of the foremost computer security experts in America today. Uh, he makes a lot of great security programs. And he does security consulting, he's got his own radio show. Um, he runs a company called GRC, and he came up with this theory called the password haystack theory. The haystack theory pretty much says any password in the world is crackable. How hard is it to crack? There's no such thing as a super secure, never going to be able to be cracked password. Every password is just a needle in the haystack. How big is the haystack, and how small is that needle? So I want to show off something over here. This is a little haystack calculator that he made. And what this calculator does is pretty much tell us what kind of password do you use? How secure is that password based upon how much time it's gonna take the hackers or the crackers with the right technology to break into it. So I wanna ask for a volunteer here. I want someone to volunteer, not your current password, okay? We're not gonna be goofy about it. Um, can someone volunteer a password that they used to use, that you do not use anymore? Yeah, okay, this is how old I mean, one second, let me get to the page. Okay. okay. So you can go to this website, it's on grc.com. This was featured on ABC News uh, in Los Angeles, uh, so it's fairly well known. Um, but go ahead and give me a sample password. Yes. Okay, lowercase w a, okay. uppercase t, lowercase e r, and then the year 2009. Uppercase t? Uppercase t. Uppercase t? That was mine. Clever. Okay, <laughs> so for example here, it were, as some basic basic hacker that's just trying to get into your account out over the internet, it would take them about 4.37 thousand centuries to break into that account. So that password's decent, it's not bad. But take a look at this. An offline fast attack with someone that has a machine that can do 100 billion oh. guesses per second, it's gonna take them 1.59 days to break into that password. Oh. Not that bad. Or if someone has the equivalent of what the NSA has in terms of computing power, it'll take them 2.3 minutes to break so into your account. A, I don't know, an asterisk between water and two And the more complex we get, the tougher it's going to so be to break into it. So okay, let's so go yes. ahead and what do you want to add into After it? After the R, put an asterisk. Just okay. Stick it in the middle there. Or at signs with two. <laughs> wow, that worked. Jump to a week. Now you can Ooh, see that even the NSA's week. computers will take a week to break into that. And the more we start adding, mm. the tougher it becomes until now it's pretty much unthinkable mm -hmm. to break into. So again, the haystack theory shows you every password's vulnerable. It's just how much time is it going to take to break into that? You want to be that target that is that tough to break into, where it's going to take centuries to break into it. That is a very good password right there. Okay, let me write it down. <laughs> no, no, don't use this password. You think up your own and you test it in the haystack, okay? But that's a dictionary word, technically water. 
Well, you I can would, type it with I one would hand. <laughs> rather go with W T R A E. Not that I'm gonna. Sure. I mean, I'd have to write it somewhere, but I think that would be better because you you said the dictionary words aren't so good. Sure. I mean, the fact that we introduced an uppercase character makes it a lot better. I mean, look how look how much easier it becomes if we make it a lowercase t. Oh. Wow. So it, it, you know it does it does change it. Um, you know, the more complex that we make no, it, but yeah, if we, if, it harder. Cuff, cuff, cuff. put it back, you'll see what I mean. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I don't know about that. hundred centuries from two centuries. Yeah. Um, oh, but as I said, very simple phrases. I like my dog. Okay. 24 minutes. Average hacker computing power. Um, Banana 14. I love Lucy. 56 <laughs> seconds. Okay? No, point five and a half. <laughs> How about something like, like a Tom 6? Okay. T O M 6. And then the M oh Y, you know, with a 5 or something. There's another member on it. Uh, oh my God. It's decent, but it's less than a second for any amateur <laughs> hacker. So, not that great. <laughs> I guess not. What's a yes. black hat? A black hat? Correct. Um, a black hat hacker yeah. um, is someone that um, is doing hacking for the nefarious oh, okay. um, yeah, reasons. Right. Like, like the white hat is good? White hat is good. Okay. Good guys. They're on our mm -hmm. side. The bad guys are these guys that you can't see. And then you also have gray hats that kind of walk. Oh, okay. So, um, take a look at this. If you're curious how good your password is, go home, go on GRC's website, and it should be under one of these little, um, one of these little, uh, let's see here. Which one? I forget which. Uh, it's under one of these. If you, if you go to Google, very simply, just go to Google, type in haystack calculator. It's the first result that comes up. It'll take you right to the page. So completely free. You can test all your passwords on this, and you'll know exactly how vulnerable you are. Um, if you've got a password that's taking an offline, the one I'd be most concerned about is this offline fast attack number. As long as that is at least in the, in the few uh, years range, you're pretty safe usually. But if you're getting something in the minutes on the fast attack scenario where someone could break in, you know, <laughs> any of these criminals from Anonymous or these hacking groups, that's equivalent of what they'd be doing. If that's in the minute range, you need to change that password. If you want to stay safe. You don't have to, but I'm, I'm recommending it. Okay? So hopefully you got something out of that. That's the top five passwords. This is not the latest list. I think one, two, three, four, five, six actually took top spot last year. Um, but if one of your passwords are one of these over here, you definitely need to rethink that, okay? <laughs> Hopefully that's no one in this room. All right, we're gonna start breezing through. We have a few more slides left. Uh, three types of malware that are most common out there today. Um, calling everything a virus is actually a misnomer. Most things that we get on computers these days are not viruses. Viruses are things that were common in the early 2000s that were out to do little bits of mischief. Um, you know, that weren't very complex. The bad stuff that's out there that we're getting on systems is one of these three. Spyware, which is meant to spy on you, just like it sounds, log your keystrokes, find your passwords, send that back to criminals, steal your accounts, get into your information, okay? That's spyware. Ransomware, very hot as of this year. It's been, it was growing starting in late 2011, 2012, but a thing called CryptoLocker came out this year. Um, that goes ahead and actually holds your files hostage until you pay the criminals. Oh, oh my God. There was a lawyer's office out east that paid the criminals to get their data back. There was a, a, a police station in out east, in Massachusetts, I believe, that actually paid the criminals because their computer security was so bad that they got this ransomware in their machine called CryptoLocker, okay? It's happening, it's a big threat. Even more reason why you need a good antivirus program, you shouldn't be using one of the free programs. They can't combat this stuff. This is a picture of the FBI virus that was out in 2012, but the 2013 variant that's even worse is CryptoLocker because not only does it lock your files, but if you don't pay, your files vanish. Well, They're gone forever. You can never get them back. I had this show up on one of my computers. This is a Windows XP computer, by the way. So when, when it shows up, what you do, do a hard shut off. Yeah. Immediately when it shows up and it cancels this. But you're praying, you're praying for um, seeing it fast enough. You're praying oh, that it's a variant. It. 
You can't make shows up. But not all of them are going to show up right away. Some of them wait and then show this up after they've locked all the files. They're getting good. There's new versions of this that come out every oh, day. Oh, okay. So the file sets. You got locked. probably one that was very basic that was just one of the first ones, and you oh, got lucky. So it doesn't work then to shut it off, to hard shut off immediately? It's the best thing to do, but it doesn't guarantee that you're oh, going to okay. be able to, to, to combat it. So, All right. okay? Thanks for the warning. And Adware has been around. Uh, this was in the mid 2000s, very, very popular. All the pop ups on our screen, not as much anymore. Uh, those are you know not as common, but they still are a problem. Advertising, of course, is an easy way for these criminals. Uh, to make money. Where can I get viruses? Physical storage, USB uh, thumb drives, external hard drives, even floppy disks. Don't think that those are immune. Anything that you can store data on can become infected. Websites on Google, search results. Just because it's Google doesn't mean you can't get infected from it. It's not Google infecting you. It's the web page you're being taken to that's infecting you. As I said, a Veterans Affairs website for the US government got infected. And people going to that website, some of them were being hit with malware being served by the website. It's not the website. It's not the Veterans Affairs Department doing it to you. It's the criminals that got in, planted the code, and are exploiting it now on visitors to the website. It can happen to any website. It's happened to big names. I think even New York Times got hit with it. Some big, big entities got hit in the last year with similar uh, items. Social media, Facebook, without saying, uh, uh, it goes without saying that this is a big avenue. Infected links on there, people sending you things on your wall that you click on uh, willy-nilly very easy to go ahead and get something off social media. <laughs> Infected downloads, all the people that are always out there hunting for free software and click on things and download things that uh, they don't know if it's entirely safe. Infected downloads are a very heavy spot, especially for the adware style of programs. A lot of free programs out there come bundled with what we call grayware. It's advertising software that comes bundled with it that, you know, Legally might be okay, but it serves up advertising and just sends money back to organizations. Hmm. I don't have to say much about this. If you're on file sharing websites, downloading movies, downloading music, you are a high risk user and you can be expected to get some kind of nasty on your machine. Households with teenagers, this is a big, big problem hmm. with them. This is where we have that dual line of security, ESET and malware bytes, uh, but you definitely wanna be staying off of these networks. Criminals love sharing stuff where people want to go and get free stuff. <laughs> it's human nature. Uh, your local network, if you have an infected computer sitting on your network, even if it's not touching the internet, if it's on the network in some way, it can spread things like Trojans and other pieces of malware, so that, that's a very easy way for that to happen. Uh, email, we beat this, <coughs> beat a dead horse on that. Email's uh, still a big issue. <clears throat> and mobile phones are even carrying malware um, today, so even more reason why you want to make sure um, that you have your phone protected. Rogue antivirus, fake antivirus was a very big issue. It, it actually still does come up. It's not as common, but I mean, Wes, you still see it on machines. Uh, yeah, um, so programs that, programs that look like antivirus, they call themselves Win7 antivirus. This is from 2012. There are 2014 editions of everything out there. They make it look like it's very scary that there's stuff on your machine and they, they give you these fake lists of stuff that's going on. All these programs are doing is giving themselves time to plant more things behind the scenes, log your keystrokes, steal information from you. They are illegitimate programs. So unless it has a vendor's name that you know on it, and even that's tough sometimes because sometimes these guys masquerade as the good guys. So it's, it's, it's tough to realize it, but you can usually tell if something's out to scare you and doing something that you can't click out of, it's usually one of these fake antivirus programs. Go and ahead. Two things. I mean, it'll usually pop up. It'll say you have thousands upon thousands of infections on your yeah, machine. Right. Whereas, like yesterday, everything was fine. Um, also, when you get those an those fake antiviruses on your machine, they are a world of fun to get rid of. Mm -hmm. I mean, it takes a good nasty. It's not. It, it's not good. Yeah, they're one of the worst. Some of the worst systems that we could disinfect. So definitely, it's it's not good. So protect yourself instead of getting in that kind of mess. What kind uh, of virus so this? They're called rogue antivirus or fake antivirus. Oh, yeah, okay. There's a whole family of variants out there. It's not just one, oh. but it's, it, that's the family. Is there any way to, to verify an antivirus program that it's genuine? Making sure you're purchasing it from a legitimate authority and downloading it only from their website. That's the only way that but you, you can say from, from the Play Store, it, it should be safe. From the Play Store, as long as it's by the organization name, like ESET or Kaspersky or any of the others, then it should be okay. So, um, on social media, um, just a few things, and, and we've mentioned some of these before. 
Uh, only friend people that you know. Never open links that seem too good to be true, like buying MacBooks for very, very cheap. Again, if it's too good to be true, it probably is, especially in the social media realm. Don't put your phone number on your profiles, okay? People are gonna use that. The bad guys know exactly where to go to get your phone number and cross-reference other things about you. Uh, and do not post about your vacation you're going on until you, uh, until you get back. What does that do? That's Telling all the criminals, hey, Johnny's house is completely open until next week. We're having a field day with stealing everything out of the house. That's how Paris Hilton's house got attacked. There you go. Even the celebrities uh, are getting hit by that. Um, email safety. One of the biggest things I'm going to say is you should consider email like a postcard. Anyone can read any email in transit as long as they have the right tools to do so. Do not send credit card numbers in email. Do not send social security numbers in email. No one of a legitimate authority will ever ask you to send something back in email of that sort. If they are asking you to, they're going to use an encrypted email service to make sure it's locked in transit. So definitely keep that in mind for yourself. Uh, you know, don't fall for the Nigerian prince scams. Don't fall for the spam messages. A lot of people have been trained about this over the years. I know I'm, you know, saying the same thing you've heard, but people still fall for this. And this is why spammers still do it, because there are people, God forbid, that still respond to these darn things. There are people that are buying Viagra off spam emails, and that's why they still send these messages out. They wouldn't do it if they were making money on it. So someone's still still clicking on these things. And they're not always, like, really ridiculous <clears throat> where it's, like, a Cupid service or, like, Viagra. I've had spam where it's, from, it says that it's from a friend of mine, and it's like, oh, I'm in Florida right now, I got mugged, like, please send me money, because yeah. I don't have money to get back home, and it's... Playing on emotion, playing on yeah. fears. If so you, get, if you get a message like that from someone, that something like that happens, call them, and ask them if that's really going on, okay? This is a phishing email. I know we only got a few minutes, but I want to definitely tackle this. Um, how does a phishing email look? This was actually from a customer that asked me, is this a phishing email? I, I, I verified for him that it actually was. Some of the uh, uh, things that make up a phishing email. The name has things like a restricted sign that you know no legitimate organization would ever put that in the from field of an email that they're sending out. That is a telltale sign if they're trying to make themselves look over legitimate by putting a restricted or copyright symbol. Um, using goofy English, like putting dot dot after the, in, in the uh, subject line. No organization would ever do that. Broken images, telltale sign right there if the image doesn't work. Logo is a bit too large to, doesn't look accurate. If you've got emails from Microsoft, you know they wouldn't take up a fourth of their page with their logo like that. Here we go, broken English. Um, due to a new vulnerability which is exploited by hackers, Microsoft Digital Crimes Unit in 2013 has hereby developed a new secure way for your security. <laughs> that doesn't sound right. <laughs> Something's a little off over here. And then they continue over here. And Microsoft products are hereby required to validate their, they're not using a possessive form of their, if you know your English, yeah. you know something's up over here. So again, look at the context of the message, look at how they're speaking in there, if it doesn't sound right, any email sent out by a big organization will be spell-checked tooth and nail. You will never get something with that kind of broken English in it from an organization. Um, and again, this was came in in 2014. They are still marking their stuff as 2013. Microsoft would never make that kind of mistake. Um, and this link over here, I have it on the next slide, but a link like that, if you scroll over it and look at where it actually takes you in the, in the status bar of your email, you'll see it goes to some goofy website not connected with Microsoft. And it looks just like this. Look at that. That's a woodgrovebank.com. Look where it's actually taking you. It's taking you to a bogus page of some sort. If you click highlight a link in an email that is supposed to be legitimate, it's supposed to take you to exactly where that is back to the organization. With Citibank, you're going back to Citibank. You're not going back to a number that you've never seen or heard of. A lot of people do not realize that if you hold your cursor over the from, mm -hmm. it'll give like it'll give you. Yeah, that's what they see what this does. So yeah. right here, I'm showing an example of it. If you roll your mouse over it, you will see yeah. where the page it actually but goes to. Amazed at how few people realize that or know that. Exactly. Most people don't think about it. They just think it looks legit. I yeah, gotta I learned, click on I it. I learned that a long yeah. time ago. So. <clears throat> We've been talking about this even more so over the last year. 
Do not use these free email services. Don't get too reliant on them. The biggest culprits in my eyes are Yahoo, AOL. These are the worst of the worst. Mm -hmm. uh, but even services from like WOW or Comcast or your SBC Global, these are not good services because their spam filtering is just not up to par. We see more infections come out of emails from these services than anyone else. They use poor security protocols on their platforms. They don't have the money to spend on good email systems. Don't think just because they provide your internet that they know how to do email. It's not true. The two outlets that we recommend by far, Gmail and Microsoft's Outlook.com service. They're really only two free services that you should be looking at. Could you repeat, for free email. Could you, what were those two? Gmail from Google. Right. And Outlook.com from oh, Microsoft. Yeah. It's the new Hotmail service. I've yes. got both. Um, one thing I want to say, if you have an Ameritech email or an AT&T email or the SBC Global email, switch because what's going to happen one day is you're going to get locked out of the account and yeah yeah who's who's the one that's providing that email service to AT&T they will not reset your password for you and if you at some point drop AT&T and switch to Comcast or WoW what they'll end up doing is just locking you out of your account yeah. and you'll never get into your email ever yeah. again. It's a big problem with AT&T accounts. So what happened is AT&T got really cozy with Yahoo about four or five, six years ago and they let each other they let at and borrow the Yahoo email service, and then just recently they got really angry at each other, so they d dissolved the relationship. So now people with these SBC Global email accounts that are on the Yahoo mail service, they treat each other like pariahs. Oh, it's not our problem. You call at and Well, it's not our problem. Yeah, uh, You call Yahoo, and you're going to go through this roundabout back and forth. It's a nasty cycle. You don't want to get locked into that. I would say do not use a vendor's email as your primary email address. It's a bad, bad idea because, as I put it, when you move, you lose that email address. Some services like Comcast let you pay for it indefinitely. Some services like AT&T, um, SBC, tell you, hey, you're off the service and you're losing the email address. If you get an email for five years and you move and you can't keep the same service, would you want to have to lose that email address that hundreds or thousands of people have? Something to think about. That's why I tell people, do not get reliant on those free email services. So currently, if you sign up with MSN mm -hmm. for email, you're going to get a dot outlook.com. Mm -hmm. But if you have a, a legacy account with them, it's the same. Like if it was as hotmail.com. Yep. Hotmail uses that now. So that's still, that's just a sale. Because it does show up. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. so it's the the problem, most problematic ones are the ones connected to these providers. Comcast, Wow. Again, because as soon as you move and you cut service with them, uh, they, are get, they have the full right to get rid of your email address. And I've had a lot of people come crying to me, and I say, I can't do anything. I really can't. I have no control. You are renting that email address from them, and they have the right to terminate it at any time. Well, what happens now, if you're in uh, a service like Yahoo, if you're deep in the service with all these yes. saved folders and so on, and then you, you can hear switch. all this You're not locked into it. You can switch. I know, but then you've got all these folders and all this information. And to switch it can be transferred in. Gmail makes it fairly easy. Outlook makes it fairly easy. It can be transferred into the service. We help people. We sit down with them. We can help you move that out of there. So we've, we've moved quite a few people last year, Wes, yeah. uh, for, from these email services. It's so it's, it's doable. It takes a little bit of time, but it's well worth it you? so you don't get caught in a trap like that. It's, it's not hard. I even do <laughs> um, So one of the last slides we have, uh, we always make this plea, upgrade your internet browser. If you're still using Internet Explorer, especially if you're in Windows XP, that means you're not using Internet Explorer that's any later than version 8, which Microsoft considers unsupported already, which most websites don't even support anymore. Um, the safest browser that you could be using out there, uh, a lot of people like Firefox, which is just fine. Firefox is very good. But Google Chrome, by far, is what we publicly recommend to people. Uh, it's got the best security protocols in place. It's got a thing called sandboxing that they use, which pretty much separates every single tab that you have open into a separate sandbox. So if something goes haywire or it tries to infect you from us one tab, it doesn't bleed into other uh, browsing sessions uh, for you. So Google Chrome is definitely one of the Google products that we push very heavily, and it's totally free. There's no reason not to use it. It's out there for um, Android phones, all Windows computers, and all Mac computers on the market. Okay, you can get that at google.com slash chrome. Very simple, easy to remember. And that is our marathon of a class. I'm going to take any questions from the crowd and, and open this up to uh, Q&A from everyone. What does the cleanup program do? Clean up? What kind of cleanup program? Like, like? Um, supposedly, if you browse the web a lot, mm -hmm. 
periodically to prevent your computer from slowing down? It's so cleanup cool. tools are usually to delete temporary files, to delete cookies off your computer, delete some of those things that build up as you go online. Because any website you go to, in order for you to see the website, it downloads a copy of that website to your machine temporarily. Most modern computers flush that data out on a, on a relatively decent basis, but older systems like XP, they don't know how to do that properly. Even Vista has some problems with clearing out that cache and those temporary files. So, you so doing that is, is actually a good thing. It's a good thing to clear out those temporary files because a lot of viruses also hang out in those areas. So Windows 8, you wouldn't need it? Windows 8, you probably don't have to worry about it. So. Any other questions? Yes. Um, do you have to have any or buy an antivirus um, product for each device you own? If you choose to go with a product like ESET, and most companies have this, if you go with ESET, we usually advise people to get like the family plan they have where you have to protect each single computer. Yes, you do have to get a license for every single computer, but they make it cheaper for every extra computer you have. Well, so you don't pay full price for four but computers. But say you want it on your phone too. Mm, I think that those are separated. They, yeah, they might be. Only the small business version, you can bundle all that. But for homes, yeah, you have to buy the mobile one for your phone separate in the Google Play Store, and then you have to go on the website and purchase eSET for your computer systems uh, through that route. And that's really so. more of a licensing restriction with the Google Play Store for the vendors. And they, it's not like they can give you a code and then you just download it because, you know, Google wants a little share of that download. Okay. Any other good questions? I just I wrote this down as Java is good or bad. Oh, uh, if you Wes is going to say something different than me. <laughs> okay, so here's my take: if you're going to use it, it's great. Make sure it's up to date. If you never use Java, just uninstall it. Oh, okay. I mean, we usually install it by default and just tell it to automatically update, but. So many people, I, I've gone and seen like two, three versions back, like that are like two, three years old on systems. Yeah, the latest version is version seven, update 51. That's the latest version that's out from Java, from actually from Oracle, the company that releases that product. If you're running like version six or God forbid version five or four in your installed programs list, you need to get rid of those old versions and go get the newer version for yourself. And so we, we so Flash it. Player's the same thing? Flash Player's get the same thing. Yep. Uh, Flash Player, okay, here's my recommendations on Flash Player. Remove Flash Player from your computer and install Chrome because Chrome has a built-in Flash Player. Yes. Oh, it's okay. always up to date. Yeah, that's another good part of Chrome is that they actually work with Adobe, they bundle Flash Player, so when Chrome updates automatically, you got latest Flash Player at all times. So that's the safest way to do it. Oh, if you're running a, a computer older than Windows 8, your Internet Explorer, you have to get a separate Adobe Flash Player download, and most people do not keep that up to date. The older it gets, the more vulnerable your computer becomes. Yeah, Chrome's so Chrome good. is the easiest way to keep up to date with the Flash Player game. Go ahead, in the back. It's, it's mm -hmm. Windows 7, is that, is that something else? Mm -hmm. Windows 7 is the predecessor to Windows 8. So Windows 7 is still in the market. Windows 7 we install for businesses a lot still. You can still get it. Um, but if you look at it from a security standpoint, Windows 8 is a decent amount safer than Windows it's 7. It's the latest, isn't it? It's, it's the latest one. It's got all the latest protections. It's got BitLocker. Uh, it's got a lot of things that Microsoft put under the hood to keep infection rates down. How much do they usually cost Windows 8 computer? Mm -hmm. A Windows 8 computer, you can buy them for as cheap as, a decent machine for as cheap as 450 bucks or so. Okay. They're not as expensive as they used to be. Very cost effective. Any other questions? Um, so if I wanted to upgrade from Windows, whatever I've got, would you say I had seven? Yes. And seven. I wanted to go to Windows 8.1. Are you saying I need a different computer? Or can you I don't, no. no. If it's a Windows 7 machine, almost any Windows 7 computer can run Windows 8. So okay. it's just a matter of buying the update and installing it. Oh, the only thing I'm going to caution is if you're upgrading from Home Edition to Pro, you have to do a clean install on your system. You have to have what? You have to do a what? Clean install. Clean install is backing up all your files, deleting the hard drive entirely, installing from from fresh, installing from scratch. Okay. You can't. It's not considered a clean, easy upgrade. You guys point. can do this, right? Oh, we can do it. Okay. Whoa, whoa. Sorry, yes. Yes. Do you charge per hour if somebody needs your services? Or yes. Or? Usually for residential, we almost always we just buy an hourly rate. Uh, hourly rate of seventy-five an hour. If you mention the library discount. 
Yeah, your first service will be 10% uh, off. Okay? If you want us to come out to the home, we can do that as well. We only charge uh, um, a, a very nominal travel fee to come out to the home, or you can come to our office. Our office is right in Uptown Park Ridge, uh, two blocks away from the Pickwick, right on the Northwest Highway. Any final questions? Otherwise, we're going to raffle off a few uh, goodie bags that we have. Oh, goodie bags. So, oh, I can't leave yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, what would it be if we came to the house? If we came to the house, it'd be the hourly rate uh, yeah. plus the nominal travel charge. That we have. Oh, okay. So, yeah, we just have to pay for our gas and, and travel. Time. All right. If you have any other smaller questions that you want to ask. Uh, just come up to us as we're you know tearing down here today after class. I'd be more than willing to answer. Wesley will be on hand. I'm going to turn off the recording so we can do our raffle and we don't get anyone's names caught on the recording. Okay? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no.